So hello and welcome everyone and welcome to this session on theorizing the medium. So podcasting and how we think about it, what it does for us and what it doesn't do. So we've, everybody who's joining us, you're welcome and thank you very much for making the time to join this first session. And we've got five speakers in this session and I'm chairing. I'm Helen Shaw. I'm actually sitting in Dublin in Ireland. So it's Friday evening, but I'm also a podcaster. And then we've been podcasting since 2005, early adopters. And we've been working in digital humanities since, you know, about 2009, particularly with the universities here in Ireland. We started Digital Joyce around 2009. So we did a podcast series around Joyce's short story, The Dead. That's how we started. And it's still online and still get lots of downloads every week. So joyce'sdublin.ie, if you want to check that out. And we can, put the, we can add things into the chat room. So one of the things that they were exploring at that stage with us was how podcasting and how audio storytelling could change the way we tell humanity stories, the way, how, the way we could educate and curate stories together. So since then, we've continued to work with all of the universities here, particularly UCD, and we went on to do a full audio reading of Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. We've also in the last year, because in the pandemic, what we have found is that all of the academics that we're working with and all of the universities, maybe they had more time, they started to train. So in this year, we've trained academics across five universities and many of them have pulled in colleagues from across Europe. So we've done all these workshops virtually since March, 2020. But we've also now worked through the entire um, academic portfolio in UCD and humanities. And many of them are now making and working on podcasts with the Museum for Modern Literature, Molly, here in Dublin. So I'm a practitioner, but I'm also somebody who has a very small footprint in academia. And what I'd like to do is introduce you to our very esteemed panelists today who are going to share their insights and their experiences in podcasting and how they've made it happen with people who are podcasters and also a, a very esteemed commentator as well. So if you can see in your gallery, we have Ray Belai, we have Philip Joseph, M Michelle Chahara, uh, Arati Vadi, and there at the end we have Sharinik Bushu. And many of you will know and already have experienced and enjoyed their podcasts and heard the stories that they're telling. I've, since I was invited to chair, I've actually enjoyed listening and dipping in to the podcast and seeing what everybody is doing. But what I'm gonna do in this session is invite each of our panelists to talk maybe for about five minutes to set out their, their own taste on theorizing the medium. What has podcasting offered to them? Why? Are they taking the time, the trouble, and the resources to do this? Because it is a lot of effort and it is a lot of additional work. So what are they getting from it? And then I suppose we've also been asked to think about the limitations, the ways in which we experience it. So Ray was first in our room today, Ray Belai, and I'm going to ask Ray to kick us off. I've been listening to your podcast, uh, Words for Granted, and it's fascinating. I love the idea that it's short and that it takes something that micro to macro in the storytelling, one word in each episode, and unpacking the whole universe of ideas in that. But Ray, you might kick us off in this session and give us your own experience of podcasting, audio storytelling, why you've gone down this road and what Words for Granted has done for you and where in a sense you see it bringing you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the introduction, Helen. Uh, so, as Helen said, uh, my show is called Words for Granted. It is an etymology and historical linguistics podcast in which uh, each episode explores in a lot of detail the evolution of a single word. Um, and I guess what has podcasting, the answer to the question, what has podcasting offered me? Well, it's offered me uh, 
an entryway and a door into uh, the world of education and academia in the first place. So unlike many of you, perhaps all everyone in the audience today, I don't work in academia. I, uh, I studied English literature uh, in my undergrad, but went on to do other things. But I always wanted to uh, continue to learn and, and, and teach about what I loved about literature and linguistics. Um, and so with the democratic nature of podcasting being what it is, back in 2015, when I started thinking about the show, I said, you know, maybe this is a way that would allow me to, you know, explore these ideas, do independent research and um, share it with a popular audience. Now, of course, that, uh, that democratic nature does, is a double-edged sword because of disinformation and oversaturation of the, uh, of the podcasting space. Um, but, you know, in my, I can only speak for myself, uh, I do take uh, the research seriously. I've had, you know, many academics on the show and have done partnerships with lots of uh, institutions and, 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 and other folks. So um, I've been able to really build that platform for, for myself. Um, now, in terms of the actual show, um, I, you know, always thought etymology and linguistics more broadly could be more entertaining than it's usually uh, presented, and particularly etymology. I mean, you have these books that, these etymology books that sort of list one word after the next, uh, and in my, in my opinion, never really going into enough detail. These books sort of left me with more questions and then books that did sort of flesh out these word stories in greater detail always felt uh, dry and boring. Some of these books had like contrived through lines connecting, trying to connect all these words. And it just never made for a very good reading experience, though the information itself was somewhat interesting. Uh, so I just, I, I just never really liked the idea of these like popular etymology books. Um, but what I did like the idea of, which back in 2015, uh, to my knowledge, then and now did not exist, uh, was a serialized audio program, 15 to 30 minutes an episode that does a deep dive on a particular word. So uh, I started doing research, I sort of developed a formula, kind of found my voice, I prepared maybe six to eight months sort of doing drafts, uh, experimenting with what podcasting offered me. Uh, and yeah, that's how Words for Granted uh, was born. Um, and, you know, with the audio, with, with the podcasting format, with the RSS feed, uh, it can, it, it allows the show to go on forever. Uh, as an audience you, member, you can sort of skip over episodes you don't like because the topic is so vast. I mean, I'm dealing with the entire English language. Uh, it, it can, it can just go on forever. Uh, I don't have limitations of corporate programming. I don't have a book length that I need to stay uh, tightly within. Uh, so that is, it, it's, it's really, podcasting is the perfect format for what I was trying to deliver um, and teach. Um, and I've also found that through, through, through the audio medium, it allows one to be more conversational uh, when it comes to explaining challenging and dense topics. Uh, and, you know, often if, if I'm trying to work through uh, a difficult or technical aspect of linguistics, uh, I can be self-aware of that complexity. I can repeat things <laughs> in a way that might be uh, cumbersome uh, in, in, in text. Uh, I can, you know, through the tone of my voice, emphasize certain things, take longer gaps, uh, and yeah, sort of, sort of just be, I, I, I'm able to, I think, cut through and deliver complex information in a more efficient and digestible way through audio, through using my voice uh, than if I were, than if I were writing. Um, that's probably about five minutes, so I can stop there. Any other uh, questions that anyone might have, we can, we can discuss. Brilliant. Thanks, Ray. And I put into chat there that I should have mentioned at the opening that Words for Granted has celebrated its 100th episode, 1 million downloads and its fifth birthday. So many congratulations because yes. that's some achievement. Thank you. Now, Thank you. I'm going to go next to another podcaster. And again, I've been listening to, she's the co-host of it, and I've been listening to it and it's great. 
novel dialogue. Many of you probably already know it, but R.P. Vade, who's an associate professor of English at Duke and the co-host of, of novel dialogue. Um, I think your, your, your other host is with us here in the room as well. So R.P., your podcast is you know, so ambitious. You're talking to writers, many of them right at the top of their game. And in some ways, it, it's up there with any of the the big name professional book review podcast that, that I've been listening to. And I also love the duration on it because again, you're doing things in a very short and accessible way within it. Could you share with us a little bit of your journey in audio podcasting and the development of Novel Dialogue? Sure, yeah. Um, so I should say hi to John, my co-host co over there and member of the HPN network. Um, so Novel Dialogue started as part of a brainstorming session for the Society of Novel Studies during the midst of the pandemic, um, like the height of it, just right after lockdowns in March 2020. And basically, um, we were debating how to respond to this, you know, sea change in everything going online and Zoom becoming, you know, the medium of all instruction. And we felt that while we could bring a conference online, while we could do professional events in just a remediated fashion, it would be a wasted opportunity for using a new medium to try to reach people outside the academy. And so we thought novel, Society of Novel Studies has always tried to bring novelists into the academy, but now we thought we should bring critics out of the academy and into discussion with novelists. And so that's how the dialogue format was born. And then we loved the fact that podcasts don't have paywalls. Um, they're easily accessible. You can listen to them anywhere and especially while multitasking. So I think internally, John and I coined the term ambient listening because we understood that people would listen at different degrees, degrees of attention. And that at least was okay with me. So sometimes you'd be listening closely and other times you would be using the format as a way to keep company while you were stuck inside or maybe getting outside for a walk. Um, so I was going to talk about two issues that I thought went to also the panel's topic, theorizing the medium. And um, the first is to do with embodied voice. I mean, I don't think I've, until I became a podcaster, did I think about sound studies or the way the voice reflects the body while also hiding the body in an audio only format. And so I, I really want to think about the ways that the embodied voice does something different than say the printed word or the physical appearance of participants say in you know a web show or a, a vlog or something like that. So I think that you know in an audio only medium, especially opposed to print uh, cadence and tone become much more available to the listener. And I think listeners pay more attention to nonverbal sound elements that would be absent in print or just less noticeable in video because you might be paying more attention to uh, body language or gesture or facial expression. Uh, so I found that the kinds of nonverbal sounds that you might not think about in a dialogue format actually really matter to the tone and atmosphere of a good podcast. And that includes silence. I think that includes vocal hesitations, you know, like the uh or the oh, or that sigh of epiphany or, or confusion or any of those kinds of, you know, nonverbal sounds. And then probably the most important sound that um, would get lost in print is laughter, right? I mean, laughter and I, conviviality are just such, such huge parts of podcasting, reminders that the conversation is, you know, operating on all cylinders, that people have chemistry, that it's, some, it's a group you want to be a part of, which I think is also crucial to keeping listeners returning to the show. Um, so another person in the room I see is James Draney, who is our blog editor. And he was helping us think about these questions too, since he had written a post on the audio culture of letters, I think it's called. And, and he turned me on to Michael Silverblatt, who hosts Bookworm. And I love this quote about the beauty of audio. And so I'm stealing it from James and I'm hopefully giving him adequate, adequate credit. But this is, uh, James is the discoverer, Michael, Michael Silver, Silverblatt wrote this. Um, and he's talking about the interview format, or if you're doing it in print, you have to invent coherence, edit for coherence, but people listening to an interview hear the naturalness and immediacy of the exchange, the freshness of it. 
I often say that people don't really listen to an interview until they hear that the exchange is friendly or enjoyable. That has more to do with the sound of laughter, of breath, with the whole alphabet of the sub vocal zoo. And so I just think that really captures the experience of a good conversation. Even if it's not technically sub vocal, it's, it's all those nonverbal elements that create atmosphere on a show. And audio atmosphere, I think, is a really crucial element of the, of the medium. And just quickly, the second major point I'll make about the limitations of audio perhaps have to do much more specifically with our format and our show. And our ambition was to always have novelists from around the world um, to try to be international in scope. And doing the show has just made me more mindful of the power dynamics of global English, um, English as the normative, the normative language of digital infrastructure. So, you know, have translating a non-English uh, speaker for audio is much more challenging, I think, than it would be in print or in video where we might be able to just use subtitles while talking to someone. So, so that is, I think, limited our guests to English speakers because the workload of doing translation would just be so much higher and we're trying to keep the content coming. Um, and the other side of it, working within English, you know, being someone who's a scholar of you know, imperialism, colonialism, global English, I, I'm happy to say that our show features so many different accented forms of English. I mean, we've had Nigerian, novelist, Indian novelist, Turkish, Mexican, Scottish, Australian. And so I think the variety of accents sometimes gives embodied weight to the content of the conversations when we're discussing translation, writing for national versus local audiences, the power dynamics of the literary marketplace. And so I think it's good that we hear linguistic difference in people's voices when we're discussing those, is those issues. And from a technical standpoint, I think knowing or reminding ourselves that when we have um, people for whom they don't speak the standard British or American English, we know that our automated devices won't work as well. You know, our transcription service will do a poorer job rendering their speech, their references, the, the, their, their backgrounds, you know, texts that are not originally written in English will be mangled. Their names might be mangled. My name is regularly mangled. Um, so the rest of our digital infrastructure, it just, the podcasting is not separate from our digital infrastructure, right? It still centers English and particularly a standard English sound. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. That's great. So many doors opened in that conversation. And as I was mentioning in chat, I have a very long background in radio. So audio podcasting borrows some things from radio, but obviously it moves in very many different ways. But we always used to say the pictures are better in audio because each person, each listener imagines uniquely in their own head the story they're being told. And that's very powerful when so many of us in audio podcasting, over 80% are listening with smartphones and headsets it's direct into our brains. And there's an academic team in Barcelona that, that I know led by a woman who are researching the neurology of that, why audio podcasting is so sticky in many ways the, whenever we do surveys with people or we do research around it, people often use the word, I'm obsessed with my podcast or I love this high emotional relationships with the host and their content. So in some ways, the Barcelona team are looking at that and what's happening with audio and audiobooks and audio podcasting in this, in a sense, almost second, if not third wave of it. Um, I'm going to go to Philip Joseph, Phil Joseph now, because Phil, you again have not just started a podcast in terms of Culture Clash, but you're also using it as a training tool. You have an upper level undergraduate class on podcasting, which almost is serving as your entry point into the podcast as well. And, you know, again, your podcast, you, you've been dealing with very popular themes as well coming into it both under philosophy and English, but curious to, to know what brought you and in a sense, your colleagues down that road. I mean, you're chair of the English department at the University of Colorado in, in Denver. And, you know, in some ways when you, you started this, I think around 2019, so before our beloved pandemic, but from that perspective, what was the thinking about it and where has it brought you? Yeah, thank you, Helen. I'm, um, I saw it. Yes, I'm, I'm coming at this as a administrator or administrator who has kind of an intense 
affiliation with the faculty and the students in my department, as opposed to the other way around and you know affiliation to administrators, upper level administrators. Um, but I started, um, I launched the podcast um, in 2019, as Helen said, just before the pandemic. And the goals were relatively modest. Um, it really wanted to foster community within our department to reach out to people who were uh, alumni, graduates of our department. Um, and then sure, if you know, we ended up reaching uh, people outside the academy, that would be great. Um, but fostering community was a really big, you know, important purpose for, for us at that time. And then it became even more urgent when the pandemic hit and we all went online and retreated to our, to our homes. Um, one of the things, so the, the, the name of the podcast is Culture Clash. We hired a graduate student who had just completed their MA um, and had done a podcast as her, pro, as her project, her final project. Um, and she was clearly very talented at it. She had uh, a textured voice to go to sort of pick up on some of the things that that Archie says. I mean, sometimes that's that that matters, right? I mean, there are voices that are that that are that strike you as um, that lend themselves to radio and others or, or to audio and 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 others that that don't do so as well. So anyway, she started the podcast, and one of the things that became really clear to me from the start is that our best episodes were incorporating multiple student voices and our worst episodes were sort of uh, talking head type podcasts where our faculty were saying really smart things, um, but they were saying them as if they were delivering a talk. Um, and, um, you know, it became sort of clear that the, the, the medium didn't really lend itself, it didn't translate the academic talk very well. Um, so to sort of pick up on um, some of the things we've been talking about in voices, um, you know, not only em embodied voices, but multiple voices, right, seemed like kind of a way, a direction that we wanted to go in and multiple student voices to bring them into the conversation um, to sort of novelize the podcast in that way um, was something that I conveyed to our host because it was very, very clear that those were our, were our best episodes. Um, in terms of the, the taking full advantage of a podcast in an academic setting. Um, you know, I also wanted to make sure that we were giving students an opportunity to, to train in creating products that they could actually put out there and um, uh, get a hear, you know, be, be listened to, right? I mean, that the academic essay that we were teaching in our classes, that most of us do teach in our classes, um, was a limited form for our students simply because most of them were not going to go into the academy. Um, they were not going to be us. Um, and, and, you know, they, the, the academic essay was essentially sort of useless for them as, as far as gaining an audience. And so a podcast was an alternative in that respect, a way to get heard. Um, and so um, we, do, we now have a, a podcast, a class, a podcast class that's sort of uh, a practicum. The students train in all aspects of producing a podcast, and then um, th actually they're the ones who produce the episode in the spring semester. Um, uh, you know, se several of them, whoever people who want to go on and produce the podcast, do so. So they've sort of taken over from the host who um, who who, direct, who ran the podcast for for two years. Um, so that's really all, all I, you know, most of the thing I, I wanted to emphasize was just the, the importance of taking advantage of podcast in an academic setting by incorporating student voices and sort of helping to realize the medium in that way, and then using it as a way to, to, to train students in creating viable products in public life. Um, and, um, you know, to me, that also sort of coincides with the importance of thinking about the humanities in a more uh, practical, utilitarian, even vocational way than we have been doing um, up to this point. I think, you know, that's, that's sort of been an emphasis of mine also as a, as a chair to move away from some of the kind of idealistic conceptions of the humanities and to, to realize that we really need to do more for our students um, to situate them after, after they leave our, our programs. Thanks so much, Phil. 
And everybody who's in the room, if you want to throw questions in, we'll have hopefully a little bit of time at the end and do chat back to us. So my next panelist is not herself a podcaster, but she has appeared on quite a few, and that's Michelle Chahara. And Michelle, you know, in a sense, I think you were recently on the American Vandal podcast, and Matt is in the room with us here. But to introduce you that you edit the economic and finance section of the Los Angeles Review of Books That's and right. in a sense that you're writing extensively about the future of media so you're writing about podcasts as they become a target of venture capital investment particularly when we see this battle between Spotify, Amazon etc breaking out big time this year. So Michelle it's really interesting we, we, we've been talking to people who are creating audio storytelling, seeing that connection with listeners. But for you as a listener and as a commentator, it's, it's really good to hear how you see and think about audio podcasting, not just within the humanities, but also within our society. Yes, thank you. Um, can you guys hear me okay? So um, it's been wonderful to hear the issues that I'm thinking about come up in the talks in what you guys have been talking about already. Um, I'm really trying to think about the democratic potential of podcasts and also what's happening as they change the media landscape and as the media landscape is changed by a financial consolidation behind podcasts. Um, I, I wanted to say really quickly in response to some of what's been said already, um, I wanted to get a friend of mine who makes podcasts, um, professional podcasts and venture investment, um, onto this symposium, I wasn't able to, he's so busy right now making podcasts <laughs> that he wasn't able to come. But one of the issues that he was bringing up uh, when I was talking to him about this was the experience that a female host of his had had um, when she created a true crime podcast that didn't fit the conventions of the genre. She did a, they did a podcast called Lost Tales and it was the New Yorker writer, Dana Goodyear. And there was a lot about, uh, she wasn't, she hadn't done podcasting before, so she wasn't ready for the, the reaction to vocal fry, um, everything that came at her around that. Um, and then, but at the same time, because they were pushing the boundaries of the true crime genre, they got a new audience for that podcast. Um, so it was really interesting to see some of that and it relates to the issues about embodied voice and the existing digital infrastructure and gender and its intersection with that. So, um, Hopefully I'll get him to the next one. <laughs> um, my own research, I'm writing about the, there's the year of the podcast in 2015 when Spotify is branching out from its deals with record companies, acquiring startups, cutting deals with NPR, and also uh, NPR invents Invisibilia and the Hidden Brain podcast, both of which think of themselves as digital startups in this new landscape, but are also podcasts, both of which talk about behavioral research. So research around the invisible forces that govern our lives, that's invisibilia, and then are also participating in behavioral research. Spotify's big play is both uh, an artificial intelligence play, a data mining play, and a platform play. So they're trying to present themselves as all of these. And so the consolidation of podcasts as part of that. Um, Spotify says that its mission in 2018 is to unlock the potential of human creativity by giving a million creative artists the opportunity to live off their art and billions of fans the opportunity to enjoy and be inspired by these creators. Um, podcasts have dominated the wave of startups in digital sound. The streaming wars in visual media are matched by similar pa patterns of competition and consolidation in streaming audio. So I'm trying to think about those patterns of consolidation in relationship to the same pattern or similar patterns in visual streaming media. Um, those podcasts were stories about the power of creativity and behavioral science. And then data analytics uses those stories about creativity and behavioral science to gather and analyze more data about creativity and data science. Um, Spotify's business model combines subscription and ad revenue streams with artificial intelligence and the power of data mining at scale. Um, I think I'll skip, I, I could talk more about that, but you've all already raised some of the affordances that podcasts have for that sense of intimacy, the relational sense of um, 
connection to the host. They are changing the way ads get written. Native advertising is back kind of from the history of um, radio. And they've played a big role in various minority communities and some of the reckoning about race and journalistic objectivity, um, all of which I think is part of that democratic potential, which is one very real aspect of, of podcasts. Um, I have taught new media classes where I've had students make podcasts as they're analyzing the media form. Um, and some of their research interventions were about the way fans relate to artists through podcasts. Um, and that's been fascinating stuff to see. I'm also on the board of the New Haven Independent, which is a local journalism outfit in New Haven. And they've really used their podcast to consolidate and amplify their very small FM radio station and to make that the reach of that FM radio station and their local journalism much broader. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about that as a democratic potential alongside the very real fact that Joe Rogan and his podcast were Spotify's biggest acquisition. He's played a big role in the ivermectin problem and in the spreading of anti-vax information. So I'm thinking about how that intimacy and that sense of doing your own research plays into the other aspects of Spotify and behavioral research that are more problematic. So I'll leave it at that. And I would love to engage with all of you on um, the kind of praxis that we're talking about here, um, as, as well as the very real consolidation that's happening. You guys are all in on the ground floor. So I think there's a way that the podcast that you're making will have a, an amplified effect on this landscape because you started doing it early. Um, so that's exciting in, in terms of democratic potential. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. And Phil, I see there's a, a question directly to, from Stacy to you there that you might even want to have a look at for a little bit later within it. Sarnak Boshu, I mean, you've got two podcasts and you're also part of the reason that we're all gathered here today with the Humanities Podcast Network. So I've been listening a little bit to the high theory podcast which you do with your with your co-host and in some ways again you know it's it's right on the money of you know telling short succinct stories and getting into in depth yet getting in depth into a key issue or area but you also have a really fascinating uh, other project which is you're one of the hosts on the new books network which again picking up what michelle is talking about with the democratizing of it it's quite an amazing portfolio of hosts and ideas and the scale of publish, publish, publishing and publication on the New Books Network seems quite amazing. So tell us a little bit about your own uh, experience with this. I know that you're a doctoral student at NYU English, but in a sense, clearly you're a devotee of audio podcasting. Yes, um, thank you so much for introducing me, Helen. I also, and I should add that I'm also very, very sick. So please forgive me if I cough through this presentation. Um, so um, yeah, I, I do, I host two very different podcasts. One is the one, the South Asia channel of New Books Network and the other called High Theory. I'm gonna talk briefly about New Books Network first and uh, Marshall Poe, whose brainchild is the New Books Network is also participating. And I really hope you get a chance to hear him. Um, so, you know, as most of you would know, the New Books Network is you know, one episode on one new publication. And it is very much the podcast form itself is inspired by the scholarly monograph. And so in many ways, it copies the book form. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I, for example, you know, go through chapters serially. Um, and so, you know, the new book has an important eventual marker in academic timelines. And so that would be analogous to, you know, other kinds of timely podcasts. Uh, that we encounter daily and like literal daily podcasts like the NPR up first, right? So <clears throat> that's new book. And um, I am not at all, you know, ashamed to admit that most of the work there is done by my guest and Marshall. I have very little to do. Um, but the other podcast that I co-host is called High Theory. And High Theory um, was also born out of, um, you know, affects generated by the pandemic and the lockdown. Um, and when we were, we have very short episodes and uh, where guests talk about one topic in theory writ large, 
So when we were brainstorming the format of high theory, this was back in um, 2020, uh, we were trying to, you know, very deliberately do something that was different as much as possible. Um, and one of the sources of inspiration was my own training in critical theory as, you know, I have been in English studies all my life, most of my life. And um, so my own training in critical theory involves a lot of frustration and I would say heartbreak because in my undergrads and during my masters, you know, theory was used to gatekeep and exclude people uh, you know, people who didn't have the proper socio-intellectual clout, people who didn't go to the proper institutions. Uh, and, you know, even those of us who have been to grad school, we are also familiar with this process where, you know, in every seminar you would have, um, some of us call them theory bros, who would um, spout Hegel and Lacan at the drop of the hat and name drop in order to alienate. That's, you know, that's a very deliberate mechanism that's, that's used. And so this kind of intellectual flexing and name dropping routinely make grad seminars undemocratic spaces. And um, so when we started High Theory, our very ambitious plan was to try to formulate something, or an approach that was more democratic and to, a democratic approach to how theory is done. And of course, I'll be the first to admit that we are you know, often unsuccessful in doing that. But I think two aspects um, of it have been you know, successful. We ask very simple questions, which is, we have three fixed questions, which is what the heck is X? How do we use X and how will X save the world? And, um, you know, going off of something that Arti was saying, our guests' reactions to these questions are as important as the answers. So for example, you know, most of our guests will have a lot of fun with how, to, how they will save the world. And I always get, you know, really um, amused when they say it won't, uh, what are you even talking about? Um, and also important is the short form of our episodes. And, you know, most of them are under 15 minutes. And so when we were deciding on how long it'll be, we thought about, you know, what activity one would be doing while you're listening to High Theory. It's not a standard commute podcast. And this is also at a time when we, several of us didn't have commutes because we were locked down. Um, so it's not a standard commute podcast. It's not a standard workout podcast. If that's the thing, that's something that you do. Um, but uh, it, it's too short for that. But you can listen to an episode of High Theory while you do your dishes, if you're not having a feast, or as like a palate cleanser between, let's say, you know, two consecutive episodes of that broody true crime podcast that you listen to. Um, so, you know, we try to use the medium of this very short form podcast to do theory in a way that is markedly different and sometimes diametrically opposite to long form conventions of doing theory. You know, we ask what the heck, but we don't have definitional mandates. Uh, we define theory very, very broadly, bringing in cultural criticism and other kinds of associative thinking. Um, we encourage tangents and digressions as opposed to, you know, gradual, graduated um, argument building. Um, and we begin in medias res, as it were, and then we end things with questions that are very much open. Um, so the goal was to counteract to a modest degree, one of the major conventions of doing theory that leaves the reader often feeling um, overwhelmed, which is the implication that one can't understand a specific theoretical formulation unless they have read through everything that came before it, and preferably from Plato downwards. Um, so, you know, that, that was something that we were trying to do, kind of to look at a, a cross section, a moment in theory, let's say. Um, so that's what we came to uh, the Humanities Podcast Network with, and, you know, when the HPN didn't exist. And we met, you know, different kinds of podcasts, like Recall This Book, which is run by John Plotz, who is here, uh, and which is a long form conversation podcast. And also short form podcasts like High Theory, like How to Read, which is one by Milan Terlunen, who's also here, I think. Um, and so we met different kinds of podcasts and we started talking. And, you know, while we are, and I think, uh, you know, the, we will agree that, you know, while we are working towards objectives such as institutional accredita accreditation of podcasts, let's say, we've been very clear in our minds at HBN that we don't want any standardization of what it means to do podcasting in the humanities. And we want as much diversity and as much difference as possible. Um, anyway, so I will, um, I think I'll stop there. It's been you know, so much fun organizing 
the symposium and everybody, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. Great, thank you so much. So lots of ideas coming out here and people in the chat room there talking about this, this idea of host voice and intimacy and also questions about professionalism and how it happens. I think one of the things that um, Shernick was just talking about there was that there is no one way to tell an audio story or a podcast. And in some ways, that's almost the beauty of it, that, that it's a way in which you can explore and find. And certainly as somebody who comes from a professional radio background with, with you know, lots of years in that, our whole approach into this when I moved into digital and set up Athena Media was really to embrace it from the grassroots upwards. So when we're training and working with somebody, we're trying to encourage them to find their own voice. And actually I stop people using the word interview and switch it always to conversation and to see themselves as part of the flow in that. Because in a sense, the one thing we know about uh, audio podcasting and it's what Phil was talking about in that, that balance between it being a lecture or a talk and something which is engaging and it's going to draw you in regularly is that it almost is, has to be much more native to how we tell stories in the real world. I'm curious just to pick up those points and maybe to go back to Ray and, and Arti around this, which would be about becoming the host. Because Ray, beyond the, you know, the aspects we're talking about in audio podcasting, you've taken on that challenge of becoming the voice for your podcast. Can you share the, the, the journey, like the, the things where you had to learn and unlearn in doing that? Because you're five years, as you say, down the road. And in some ways, it is a journey to find your own voice and feel comfortable in bringing yourself fully in, in front of the microphone. Yeah, sure. I'm not sure that I have uh, a, a, a very clear, defined answer on this. But, you know, if, if I go back and listen to the earlier episodes, they're certainly uh, stiffer. I, uh, so it is a scripted show, something that I didn't mention earlier is that it's sort of, in the case of my show, it is a performance in some way. I do have a script uh, just because the, I, I'm telling researched stories. So it kind of, uh, they're not academic essays per se, though if you look at them on paper, they are, but just the moment that you animate them with voice, uh, and sort of take advantage of all of these subvocal uh, elements that have been discussed, then, you know, depending on your delivery and like the, if you write in a sort of casual tone, but sort of in the format of the academic essay, then it sort of, it, it transforms into something else. Like the way that I uh, speak on the podcast is a slightly more coherent version of how I'm speaking to you now, because I, you know, I'm, I'm reading a script and not improvising words and thoughts off the top of my head and responding in real time. But um, yeah, I, I would say for me that as I came to know my audience and just, you know, uh, through, through email exchanges, through, uh, honestly, mo mostly through, through email because the, the words for granted brand is not terribly active on social media. So I would just have these uh, email conversations with, with strangers and I kind of got to know them and sort of I then I have this faith in myself like if they are you know they find value in the show they're telling their friends about it they're sharing it with uh you know some, some professors are sharing it with their uh classes etc that it, it sort of that validation gave me license to be comfortable to be me and and, and in some way I from the time I started the show I did kind of have this vision of what the voice should be but i think over time it's just become more natural and it's become more more conversational without sort of losing the um the integrity of the research and the storytelling and the coherence of like what what i'm trying to teach but uh yeah i would just wait, say wait. Oh. i'm going to bring arati in there again because in some ways um you're co-hosting, but again, in listening to it, you sound incredibly comfortable in your host voice. And it would be good maybe just to, to take us through your own experience with that. And, and in some ways, you know, this conversation about professionalism versus podcasts that come out of the 
anchor in the heart of digital humanities itself. Because sometimes people will feel, oh, we need the professional host and a professional producer. Whereas sometimes when I'm working with people, I'm really trying to get them to originate it and own it themselves. Yeah, you know, I think um, when I try to, I don't know if I feel comfortable saying I've found my voice, but I know for sure that the first episode of the season, I can feel the rustiness, right? When I'm in introducing the show, it does sound a bit stiffer. And then the more recording you do, the more you find your cadence and what might not actually be your intimate voice, but is the public version of your intimate voice. And it's very much like teaching. I often think that a great warm up for teaching a seminar is listening to a podcast about a text because you're all of a sudden in a conversation at the level of articulation, which I think you would take into an undergraduate classroom or a grad classroom, you're not deep in the weeds of your own head or of, the, or of print. So I feel like my voice is teacherly, but very lightly so. It's not teacherly in that I'm authoritative, it's teacherly in that I believe I'm friendly and accessible. And I also, I have the advantage of having, a, of facilitating a dialogue, not necessarily leading it, but facilitating, which is different, right? So the critic on this show designs the arc of the questions in conversation with me and takes us through that. But then I get to slide in every now and then with a more spontaneous organic question and bring them into different arrangements, the critic and the academic. And I really like that part of the job. I think I do best when I'm responsive, not when I'm always initiating. So, so that's where I feel my strengths as a host lie and that kind of responsiveness to what's happening in the moment, which is also a teaching skill, so. Brilliant. And um, when I'm working with somebody on a podcast strategy, we get them to think about two things, what's their story, but secondly, and in parallel, as equally important is who's their audience. And always it comes back to that thinking and knowing and really talking with somebody rather than having that abstraction around it which in some ways as you say is exactly what you have to do when you're going to teach a class in undergraduates. I mean Phil from your side you mentioned that right in the beginning about that that sense of finding the connection that the podcast would have with its audience. Do you have a sense that you can take us through where Culture Clash is now and, and who its audience is and how it's connecting with them? Sorry, we, um, we, we do have listeners all over the world, but very few of them. So most of the vast majority of them are in Denver. Um, and most of them are affiliated with our department in one way or another. So, you know, we just don't have the, the right now, the, the, the funding, the resources to really make a push to expand the podcast. And honestly, I'm kind of less interested in doing that. I mean, you could sort of tell from my remarks that for me, um, it really is not, is not about the number of downloads at all. It really is, you know, a, a, a way, a tool for attracting students to the humanities, for making them more excited about the kind of knowledge that we produce and the forms that they can produce it in. Um, that's basically the, the, you know, for our department, I think that's probably the, the way to under, to conceive the podcast. I mean, I feel pretty certain about that. Um, I, one of the directions, I, one of the things I would like to do is to have something equivalent to a writing center on campus mm -hmm. where students can go, um, you know, to, it would obviously encourage student assignments, um, you know, for faculty to assign podcasts as possible um, projects, right? And then to have a center on campus where they could receive technical help and, and help in organizing a podcast, producing a podcast. I mean, to sort of piggyback on some of the things that have been said, I think it's really important just because you're emphasizing student participation, not to lower your standards, to, to encourage highly produced podcasts, like well, you know, well-conceived, such as, you know, scripted to, to use Ray's word, um, you know, I think that's that all of that is really important. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, not a big fan of the gab fest, you know, like that, that, that format. I mean, it's fine, but it, it not certainly not as something that, um, you know, I would encourage yeah. as far as training goes. 
Great. And um, Michelle, you were bringing into the chat room there a thought about the, this this uh, dichotomy that you might say between uh, our emphasis on int intimacy. Do you want to expand that a little bit? Sure. Um, someone else, uh, I can't remember who said this now, someone was asking, um, does, are we taking intimacy for granted? Or is this something that we are both, and I think it's coming up now in the conversation, are we training students and other new newcomers to the forum to perform a kind of intimacy, to bring the listener into a kind of intimacy? Is that what we mean by when we say finding your voice? Um, and how are we thinking about how that um, is created within these existing infrastructures and contexts where um, existing power structures don't go away because of the democratic potential of the medium. Um, I love the way Sarana talked about the way theory has functioned as a gatekeeping form in the academy, but that it's also can be quite radical. And when you, I, I listen to high theory and the way you introduce the name of the podcast <laughs> um, to make it a joke is possible only in, in an audio form, right? They, they go, hi, theory. Um, and I think that that, works with the gatekeeping function of theory, but then ironizes it, plays with it in the audio form. And I think that that opens up that authority to other people and makes that a more democratic space. So I think um, everyone is already working through the ways that intimacy functions and that um, also the relationship functions, right? You, the gab fests can be extremely boring. And my experience with students making podcasts is that they go for that right away and they want to record long sessions of themselves talking to each other. Um, and that's, I think that can be, um, it can be a way in. And I think we've all talked about the ways that having a conversation and having some of that immediacy and aliveness on the podcast is one of the benefits of the podcast, but it, um, it can go too far. This is, a, this is a complex and nuanced set of moves, rhetorical moves that we're thinking about. Um, I see Pella has a hand raised. Pella. And maybe we'll talk about- Oh, what, Pella, um, hi. Do you, do you want to come in there, Pella? Pella was talking about some other research in the chat by Sarah Florini that I thought was also very relevant. Pella, do, do you want to come in? Maybe she's raised her hand. Pella, um, yeah, sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, so it's, it's interesting to hear all of you talk about um, chat casts and sort of this way because that's sort of the, the space that my research in podcasting is, is that I look at podcasting as a performance medium and how per performance is e ephemeral performance and that ephemerality um, that happens with embodied um, things, with the embodied voice um, drives presence for the listener and that it is looking at it from the agency of, of the performer and how do we do that? And I think one of the reasons that I prefer chat casts is because there is less of a commodification and um, um, modulation through editing of the individual performances within a, a, a podcast. And some remarkable quotidian things can happen in the chat cast that might often get edited out of a more narrative piece. Like even Serial uses the quotidianness of the chat cast as a device in its narrative storytelling. So I'm, I'm curious if maybe it's time to sort of reconsider the role of the chat cast, particularly within public scholarship and within, um, within podcasting discourse. Great, thank you, Pella. Um, we're into our last five minutes. Um, there was a question there about saving the chat. I think I'd said that, but I think uh, Sharanak is gonna have to give that to people because it doesn't come up normally when I'm running a Zoom session for ourselves. Um, you can simply empower that. But Sharanak, are you there? Yeah, yeah, that at least is not my fault, it's NYU's fault. And okay. NYU has unilaterally disabled they Saving disabled that. it because normally that's it. Whenever we're doing a workshop, because we, people throw uh, links in and all these kind of tips, I say, if nothing else, save chat. 
So um, therefore, if, if you want, they will be part of the recording. It will be saved by, by Sharon out there. Um, just in the last session, I mean, there's a lot of questions coming back, obviously, about that idea of, of teaching and the learning aspect. And some of them are broader than what we can reach in a short period. But Phil, maybe because you're at the heart of seeing this as part of what you're doing in, in the undergraduate, any thoughts there? If you look at the, the question there from Jen Shook, when I get students to really work on editing, I find it so useful to broader conversations about revision and shaping and selection and modular creation. And Bradley is saying, I try to divide teaching content and craft as two sides of the coin. So again, it's a whole other ball game from making podcasts as a way of sharing digital humanity stories with the public engagement, whether with students or with the broader range. But there is kind of a sense in the group to maybe just talk a little bit further about teaching as well. Have you any thoughts, Bill? So I don't, I don't teach the the practicum. Um, my colleague Michelle Comstock does, and she's her background is in rhetoric. Um, she is also, you know, somebody who's in researching, she's a researcher in sound studies now, um, and she uses the term audio composition, which I find really helpful, um, as opposed to podcast. So it emphasizes, you know, from a student perspective, There's that there structure. are all these kind of compositional elements yeah. um, that the students need to think about when they're creating their, mm. their podcasts. I mean, that's, mm. I'll, I'll stop there, but. Again, I suppose from my perspective, because now in some ways podcasting almost doesn't cover all the ways in which audio is working in this way that we, we call it audio storytelling and we, we incorporate storytelling craft into audio technical skills within it. We're kind of coming up to end time on this, but I'm just going to ask those who are running podcasts, maybe if they have a tip, a sharing because you guys have done it as well with the group. So Ray, going back to you, um, if you were to share one learning curve with, with people that you've got from your podcast, what would it be? And you have 30 seconds. Yeah, I would say uh, some, something, something when I started, I was always unsure of how detailed to get again, because the, show is about historical linguistics. It can get quite heavy at times, but uh, I learned over time that, you know, my, my audience likes that. And so not to underestimate their, uh, their interest in the subject and of course their intelligence. And so, you know, e even though it is a lay audience, it is a lay audience interested in what I am teaching. So uh, to, over time, I became more comfortable in sort of giving them what they want, and again, using the voice, using the audio medium to sort of repeat, uh, to turn what is difficult into something, something approachable. Is, yeah, approachable. That, that's the idea. Arathi, would you want to share a learning curve, a tip? What would you like to leave people with? Yeah, I think two tips. One, try to warm up your guests before you record. Try to have a little conversation beforehand. And the post-production tip for, for me, this is like huge. I do all editing and synopsing, synopsizing at once because it, I think it's way faster if you're trying to produce a show to make your edits, write your summary, craft your tweets, and then have them ready to go. Because if you keep coming back when a week after or a week after, you're reinventing the wheel every time. So it's a time saver to do it all at once. Brilliant. Sharon, do you want to give us that end tip? What would you leave people with uh, if oh, they're going to well, move into podcasting? Um, this is not very general, but I have found editing can be meditative. And oh. I am a very impatient person as a rule. And, but editing has helped me calm down. Uh, so I recommend it, even if you don't have a podcast. You know, get the raw files from your friend who podcasts and just edit. Um, yeah, and you know, um, I look forward to. But well, Matt is agreeing with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Matt has been on my podcast, and I had a lot of fun editing his episode. Um, yeah, and talk to us at HBN. Thank you so much for coming. Brilliant. Listen, 
we, that's the hour. Thank you so much for giving us your time. There will be a recording and do stay with the other sessions that are coming up. And thank you everyone for joining us in this one.